just 7.30, I'm going to get started. Hi everyone, welcome to week four, week five, week four, week four live chats uh, of the Survive Your PhD MOOC. Uh, welcome, thank you for joining our live chat tonight. We're nearly halfway through the course now, uh, next week is the halfway point. Thanks for all the great discussions this week on frustrating feedback. Now there certainly was a lot of frustration express, expressed in the discussion forums. And um, I'm sure many of us could relate to some of the stories being told. And I was really impressed by the level of interaction between people and the suggestions that were coming through. I'm just going to adjust down slightly. No, this is bad form. There we go. Okay. Um, now, remember the activity that we give you is a suggestion. Uh, we only actually asked you to contribute to the discussion board. So you can just reflect on someone else's doing of the activity or you can do it yourself. We've carefully chosen the activities to try and extend the learning or the observations or um, to fix your your mind on the theme that week. Uh, but you follow them as you wish. So the one coming up this week, this coming week on loneliness is actually my favourite. Um, but feel free to participate as you wish. Now, before we get to the questions for this week's live chats, badges. Yes, it's very exciting when you get a badge. It sounds lame, but you know you want them. You really do want them. And this week we're giving badges for discussion forum activity to Kimberly AM. Thank you, Kimberly. You had some really great responses to other people and you offered some wise and sound and empathetic advice. And thank you to Skatesky, S-K-A-T-E-S-Y. I don't think I got that right at all who was nominated by our moderator, Margaret Prescott, uh, because she noticed that the really interesting discussion that um, that, that comment prompted. And so thank you to Kimberly and Statesky. Um, on Twitter, outstanding contributors uh, were Lialia Mantai and Cam, Cam Vandenberg. So uh, we'll be sending you links to your badges very shortly. Okay, so tonight we were going to have Steph, one of our moderators, um, broadcasting, but unfortunately Steph isn't feeling well. So if you're watching Steph, I hope you're feeling a lot better. And um, I managed to fill in the last little bit, so don't you worry. Okay, so uh, first off we had Lisa NZ who asked, I'm trying to develop or set up a writing group for my department, Statistics, and we're looking at developing a peer feedback system as part of it. I'd like to know, tips of developing our feedback skills as a writing group, and general tips for growing a successful writing group, especially in the STEM subjects. Now, you may or may not know it, there is a mass of literature with a capital L on writing groups. In fact, it's one of the areas where people like me, learning skills advisors, uh, academic um, teaching and learning people, love to focus attention and research on, because uh, we find they're a really effective way of learning to write of keeping writing, developing writing skills. As many of you'll know, I'm a big advocate for the shut up and write. Give it a love heart by tapping the screen if you shut up and write, because shut up and write is wonderful. Um, so I'm a big fan, and boy, could I bore for Australia on the topic of writing groups, I really could. Um, but I don't have time to do that here. So instead, and I might actually address some of this in our chat about loneliness next week, but I did have two books to recommend. One of them I have a chapter in with Lindy Osborne and Glenda Coldwell, about Shut Up and Write, actually. Um, and that's not why I recommend the book, because it's just, it is um, full of other people who are a lot more experienced and smarter than I am writing about writing groups. It's called Writing Groups for Doctoral Training and Beyond. And Katie, or the other moderators that are here, are going to be tweeting out the link um, to the review on the Thesis Whisperer, which has a link if you want to go and buy that book. And the other book that I highly recommend if you're interested in this kind of practice is Writing in Social Spaces by the wonderful Rowena Murray. Um, it's that rare combination of both practical and theoretical. So she weaves the two together. Rowena came to visit us at ANU last year and we're very lucky here to be able to invite people of her calibre to come and visit us in, in Canberra. And she ran some really fantastic sessions for us on how to do writing groups. And one of the things that she advocates is what she calls a containment strategy. So the thing about writing groups is containing the time and space, um, basically forcing you to be in a place so that you have to write. So, but she, she, she develops that idea much more theoretically and interestingly than I have there. So check out those two books. Um, if you're watching this Periscope broadcast later on, we'll be posting the Storify and the links will be in that Storify. Uh, Rohina one asks, I'm looking for a good resource to help me write up a discussion and conclusion section for a paper for a journal submission. And I'm writing in the area of health and social science. Now, 
It's really tricky, the discussion section, and that's why you'll find most books uh, that are aimed at PhD students avoid it altogether. Because it's subject specific, you know, it's actually really tough. Sometimes we know how to do it, but we don't know how to talk about it and so on. It's one of those sort of really murky areas of PhD advising. Um, I have had a go at it. Uh, I did write a post a while back called How Do I Start My Discussion Chapter? Um, in it, I suggested a series of techniques, um, some of which I stole from the Masters of Social Science. Some of these techniques will work really well for scientists too, I've found, and I've used them in our thesis boot camps as prompts to help people get through the discussion writing phase. So one of them is the compare and contrast technique. You can just take the whiteboard like I have behind me, draw up a table, where's your work similar and different to others. It's high school level. It's the sort of stuff my son learned in grade six. Um, but they're actually still really helpful techniques and having it big out on the whiteboard will enables you to think about it in a different way. Uh, Howard Becker, a renowned social scientist in his Tricks of the Trade, talks about the big machine trick. And the big machine is if you had a machine that produced the results you were looking at, just describe the machine. You know, what does it look like? What parts does it need? What makes the machine break? And so on. That's, um, that using the metaphor of the machine is actually really quite an interesting, sometimes useful way to produce discussion section. Another suggestion from Becker, again, is the null hypothesis technique, where you write down um, why the results mean nothing. Um, and then it, that actually forces you to argue the reverse position of why they mean something, but at least it gives you something to argue against. Also remarkably effective and simple. Sometimes just having a target audience can really help. So explain the results to a friend in an email um, and justify yourself. And sometimes just the email, the act of writing an email, as I talked about in a webinar earlier this week, for those of you who managed to join us for that, um, actually uh, having a very well-defined audience in mind is really quite useful for, for producing good writing. And email's a good way to do that. Um, and then one last thing to do is before you write the discussions chapter is to explain the limitations of the work. So what's left to do? Um, what what you might the study add or better define and sometimes just articulating these can help you write the sections that support those claims. Okay, I'm not the only person who's written about discussion chapter at all. Um, Pat Thompson, a friend, mentor, fellow blogger, has some two excellent posts on that which um, Katie and Richard are going to tweet out at the moment. Um, one's called Writing Course, Common Problems with the Results and Discussion Chapter. And the other one is called Structuring the Results and Discussion Chapter. I can't recommend those highly enough. Um, Pat is a lot more experienced, older, wiser head than me. Nutella, I said that. She's got much, much more interesting hair than me. It's very red. <laughs> okay. Um, I also like very much the sentence scaffold method. And this is from, um, from Pat Thompson again. Um, but fully fleshed out in the Manchester Phrase Bank, some of you may be familiar with, this absolutely amazing resource. The two sections in particular that's useful, both for scientists and for humanities and for creative arts for that matter, are the reporting results and discussing, dis discussing findings sections. And again, Katie has those links and she's going to tweet them out now. I should explain that tonight I'm joined by my trusty assistant, Katie, and I'm going to get her to to wave. Hello, Katie. Hello. Love hearts for Katie. Hi, everyone. And behind Katie, there's Richard. Richard Robinson. What are you on Twitter at the moment, Richard? Triple R zero eight two. Triple R zero eight two. It's very very personal. <laughs> Richard is the director of ANU Online. He's observing us tonight, and as usual, Katie is blocking the view of Mr. Sorry. Thesis Whisperer in the corner there, who is Cody. Anyway, he's busy. Okay. So uh, thank you guys for joining me tonight. And online, I think we've got Jonathan Zbaznik. Absolutely. Uh, do any of our other moderators there tonight? I have only seen Jonathan. Only seen Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan. Thanks. <laughs> okay. Annabella Donna writes, I sometimes just don't want to air my frustrations with my supervisors. I'm aware they are already overloaded and I feel I must do all the problem solving myself because after all, I'm working at this level. Also, when it comes down to the wire, most of my frustrations are with myself and not with my supervisors or my own progress, my slow pace, writer's block, not getting a chapter in the right shape. Because these are my personal battles, I don't necessarily want to share these frustrations with my supervisors. 
I suppose that's a bit out of fear of judgment or feelings of inadequacy, which again were my responsibility to work on. Now, Sharon Young had a really good response to this. She said, I think it's a question of one, how your relationship with your supervisor is. Two, how you present it to them. Remember, your supervisors have a vested interest in you doing well and explain that you are stuck or struggling and ask for strategies to help manage this. By asking for strategies to manage a known problem, you A, bring the problem to light so you're not battling it yourself, um, and B, shows you're taking ownership of the problem, not dumping it on your supervisor, and C, gives you access to some solutions. And I think those were actually really good suggestions. Um, and I think sometimes we hold ourselves back from telling supervisors our problem because there's this need to look like we're smart. I mean, your supervisors already know that and they've experienced all of these problems too themselves, no doubt. And just sharing or airing these problems, just having a think through and first having an attempt to solve the problem and presenting your attempt, um, is, it shows maturity and taking ownership even if you haven't actually solved the problem itself. So sometimes I think um, asking for help um, is, is difficult to do, but the worthwhile strategy. So think about it again, and I've said this before on other live chats, it's a bit like a job. Do you take the problems to your boss without any attempt at solving it at all? You probably wouldn't. First of all, you'd have a go and then you take it to your boss. So I think the same strategy works here as well. Okay, C Holden 14 asks, my supervisor is pretty good at writing, but has never given me any feedback. Goodness me. Okay, for a paper, he took the draft and just completely rewrote it, then accepted my edits. I don't know if he has even read any of my reports. With the literature review, he complained that they took too long, too much effort to write, and so he didn't want to publish it. Therefore, I've never received any feedback. This isn't personal. There's a myth that he doesn't even read students' theses. Well, um, <laughs> any suggestions, Z Holden 14 asked, about how to ask for feedback? I had treated it as implicit requests by presenting the written work. So by sending the work, you assume you're going to get some feedback. Well, that's a natural assumption. And so first of all, I'm really sorry to hear that you're experiencing this. As um, Kimberly AM, who we gave a badge to, wisely pointed out, he sounds like a person that just can't be bothered and doesn't want to put in the effort of giving feedback. But when he does, he goes overboard and re re rewrites your whole work. And that's a pretty good summary of sounds like what's going on there. I agree with this. I think it's actually quite a very old school approach to supervision, but unfortunately there's not really a lot maybe you can do about it. I wonder if you explored alternative means of support. Uh, perhaps you have something like our academic skills and learning unit, people who will sit with you and work one-on-one -on -one through the writing of your thesis. We're a very full service university here at ANU. We invest, as I've said, a lot in our research training. So we have quite a lot of people working in that kind of space. Your university may have more or less, depending on how much they invest. Um, Rohan, I uh, suggested asking for specific feedback, and I thought this was a good comment too. Ask, is the writing coherent? I would, uh, I would add to this, you can be even more specific. So you could say something like, what do you think of the argument I advance on page 24? Do you think it's coherent? Specific and actionable feedback are much more likely um, to, to get responses that you need. Sometimes just sending four or five pages to another colleague, not the whole chapter, not the whole thesis, a small, discrete, manageable amount and saying, well, what do you think of how I'm arguing things here? Or do you think I'm presenting evidence in a compelling way? And sometimes it's the help that you get on that one small piece of the thesis, you can generalize to the rest of it. Um, our moderator, Katie, suggested that you submit to your thesis supervisor a list of questions you have that you would like to address when they read it. So ask some questions about your argument, use of sources, data, logical flow, etc., so that you can discuss it in your next meeting, which is um, sort of aligns with what I'm saying there too. Okay, um, an anonymous poster asked, how do we treat the feedback that we don't think is right? And um, wow, yes, um, one of the key things about being a research student is making new knowledge. And that means sometimes we disagree with how knowledge has been made in the past. And this can produce all sorts of anxieties in people uh, because they're having to make knowledge claims. And knowledge claims can be a little bit scary uh, because you may be not that sure about them. And especially if they go against the received wisdom that, um, that is in your discipline or area. So Kimberly AM again wrote back a, a fantastic response. She said, I'd be also interested in this question because I feel like one has to be political about these things. 
In other words, sometimes you may have to kind of change certain things in order to show the journal you're publishing in that you value the feedback of their reviewers. Or in the case of your supervisor, you might want to keep them happy because they're the ones deciding if your dissertation is passable or not. My feeling is, Kimberly AM said, is that you need to pick your fights and only go against feedback if it really matters to your argument. She wonders though if this is the right attitude. Well, you know, it's on the right track. I think we have to acknowledge that there's politics of academic writing and they're very present sometimes, especially in things like journal articles. Now, Cassily Charles though has written a series of fantastic posts on the Thesis Whisperer and she talks about mismatches between supervisors' um, styles and expectation of writing and students' expectations and styles of feedback. I pulled out a couple in particular that are worth having a look at and that the moderators are going to tweet now. So in Are You On The Same Page As Your Supervisor, Cassidy points out that we need a meta language to talk about writing with our supervisors. What you think of as a draft might not be what your supervisor's inner conception of what a draft actually really looks like. Um, in our research, students like meerkats, Cassidy talks about different kinds of reactions that are possible to feedback. And in the ex-wife strategy, such a great name for a post, Cassidy has some good advice on how to prepare for feedback and how to prepare yourself to respond. Um, I'd also like to put out, point out another excellent blog that I've been involved with in the past. I helped to get going, but I stepped away because I have always too much to do. And they seem to be managing quite fine on their own. This is the Doctoral Writing SIG, S-I-G, Doctoral Writing Special Interest Group. Um, it's excellent um, moderators and editors of that blog who are all professional writing teachers if you haven't discovered it yet. It posts once a week and it has excellent posts on writing and uh, Katie is going to tweet out the link now. It's doctoralwriting.wordpress.com. Okay, Adam Rankin quite candidly admitted, I winced at the video and if you watch the video of Stephen Pinker, um, you may remember it, and heard some of my writing style in it. I can translate what I do to my friends and non-academic colleagues, but then face difficulty in blending the simple and the complex. How do I put the appropriate academic over filter over the relaxed discussions that I have? Now, um, my friend and collaborator, Sean Lehman, has a really interesting take on this, and he points out word origin. Um, if you look at the etymology of words, that's where the words come from, what language they originated in, and um, where they've ended up in our language, English, You'll find that Latinate words, that's words derived from Latin and French, are fancier than Germanic or Old Norse words. Um, and this relates all the way back to the Norman invasion of England when Fran French was the language of the elite. So instead of pig, you have pork. Um, instead of um, cow, you have beef and so on. Um, now you can use the Google define function. So just type define colon the word and if you scroll down or you get the whole list of the word definition, it'll show you the etymology when the word was first um, recognised in dictionaries and so on. So the simple trick that Sean advocates is to take the Germanic word and substitute it with a Latin word to make it fancier or vice versa to make it simpler. It's amazing. It really, really works. The other, the other way to look at sort of doing this translation of your text from fancy to straightforward or trying to fancy something up or make it less fancy is to look at your verb use. Now, I could again bore for Australia on the subject of verbs. It's <laughs> so long to go into here, but I have some really detailed instructions on a slide deck called Spring Clean Your Writing, which Katie is uh, tweeting out now. Belibio asked, Stephen Point... Pinker points out the dichotomy between writing clearly and expressing the uncertainty inherent in doing science. He suggests that we should write in more classic prose or naive realist style and count the reader to fill in the uncertainties because they also know of the tacit controversy in scientific work. However, in practice, I find that I tried that style and many reviewers complained. Some even decided to reject my paper because they felt that my assertions were too strong. I feel that the peer review system exerts enormous pressure on me to stick to the already entrenched writing habits of the community and not take risks, such as deviating from the let norms and might lessen the chance of getting published. Um, and it's a very difficult, again, and complex area. And as Kimberly pointed out in her response to that, writing is definitely a political act. Um, now, uh, there's... There's a few things that I can suggest here, um, but rather than sort of getting to really general comments, I think I'm just going to point you at a few resources, um, and Katie's going to tweet these out now. 
There's a post um, based on hedging on the biomedical editor blog, which is quite useful. It's highly technical, but it's quite good. And hedging is the term we use for how to say what you don't know. And one of the key challenges in science is actually learning to hedge well. Uh, in fact, mastery of hedging is sort of a deep in the science agenda because science is never fixed. It's always um, under a process of revision and renewal. Um, there's another good article that we're tweeting now on researching the problem of replicating practices. And there's a couple of good blogs, again, doctoral writing, SIG, and exploration of style. Okay, Shelley of the UK asked us about getting in the zone, but then she said, the problem is that, however, I don't really enjoy other types of writing, especially paraphrasing. I tend to write paraphrased notes as I read articles, and then I use these and I write a piece of chapter, for example. I do this less than I should because I just don't enjoy it. Yet the text I create depends on it. As a result, my writing becomes too concise because I summarise and write more thematically rather than going into the details of the studies. From the literature, I know the points I need and want to make and I want to get on with it. I worry that this will lead to a reduced word count and make my work appear as though I haven't delved into the specifics of the studies or theories. Uh, for example, any suggestions are welcome. Um, I know what you mean, actually, because you get these endless passages and it's like eating dry toast, right? Dry, dry toast is like lots of chewing and not much swallowing. It's very frustrating. So um, you get lots of the endless Mewburn argues, Mewburn states, Mewburn does whatever, Mewburn whatever. Anyway, it gets really dull. So I came across a great article while trying to think how to respond to this question on paraphrasing from the QUT Library. Thank you to the QUT Library Twitter feed for that. Um, and that might help you change it up a bit. So we're going to tweet that link out now. Uh, this was my favourite question of the week. Um, Brenton Groves asks, how many peer-reviewed papers overloaded with reference, are overloaded with references just to give the thesis a pass grade? based on weight. Um, similarly, Cherry Stewart, in a follow-up post, asks, it's been suggested to me that I need to be careful about how I reference. Does the reference add direct credibility to that argument? Is it required to give substance, or is it just used to present another point of view which might be argued against? Now, to which I reply to both those questions, all of the above. And I'm going to read you a rather long quote from one of my favourite theorists, Bruno Latour, about the subject of referencing, so just bear with me. It's translated from the French, so there's some sort of funny languages. And this, this one is from following um, science and engineers through society. And he says, The effect of references on persuasion is not limited to that of prestige or bluff. Just directly addressing what both those um, people were asking. Again, it is a question of numbers. A paper that does not have references is like a child without an escort walking at night in a big city it does not know isolated, lost, anything may happen to it. On the contrary, attacking a paper heavy with footnotes means that the dissenter has to weaken each one of the other papers or else be threatened with doing so. Whereas to attack a naked paper without references mean the reader and the author on the same weight face to face. He goes a little further down and uses an example of a paper that had 35 references on it from 1948 to 1971. And he says, if you wish to do anything to this text, and what it by, mean, by which he means if you want to criticise this text, this text, there is no other way of getting rid of the argument you know in advance. You might have to engage with all of those papers and go back as far in time as necessary. It's kind of like an army that's massed around your paper and you have to attack all of these other papers one by one in order to demolish the problem. But he points out the key problem later on with over-referencing or not referencing appropriately. He says, however, Stacking masses of references is not enough to become strong if you are confronted with a bold opponent. I like that idea. On the contrary, it might be a source of weakness. If you explicitly point out the papers you attach yourself to, is it then possible for the reader, if there are still any readers, to trace every reference and prove its degree of attachment to your claim? And if the reader is courageous enough, the result may be disastrous for you, the author. First, many references you might have misquoted or made wrong. Second, many of the articles alluded to might have no bearing whatsoever on your claim and might be there just for display. Third, other citations might be present, but only because they are always present in that author's articles, whatever its claim, to mark affiliation, to show which group of scientists, for instance, he identifies with. These citations are called perfunctory. Now, if you want to read more about what Bruno Latour says, and I love the, con 
um, the comparison of a paper to a child in the city at night or somehow that the paper's under attack, it's in a fortress and it has an army of references around it. So you've got to get the army right, right? There has to be people in those key defensive positions and it has to work, I think is his main point. So that's on page 33 and 34 of Science in Action, How to Follow Scientists and Engineers Through Society. And I've given the rather huge Google link to Katie, to the Google book, um, or you can buy the book itself online. Um, and finally, an anonymous um, poster asks, what's everyone's favourite resource to consult while writing academic papers? I have heaps of suggestions, of course, and you've already seen my bookshelves last week, which are full of books. Um, so I have collected a whole lot of them on an Amazon affiliate store, which supports the blog. So any book that you buy through that is gives money to help me host the blog. Your decision, though, they're just there with my little pocket reviews and recommendations. They're all the books I own and use in my work, and the only books I put in there are the ones I really truly believe are fantastic for anyone to use. So Katie will tweet that link here, but again I say this is not a profit motive. You can just look at the name of the book and buy it wherever you like, of course. I offer some free downloadable worksheets, and some of these worksheets are adapted from the material in those books. They're called my Blackline Masters series. They're designed to go on one side of an A4 page, so you can easily photocopy them, use them in classes, hand them out to students, pin them on your wall, whatever. So we'll just link to the Blackline Masters series. Um, and Alison Jane uh, on Twitter recommended the work of Margaret Carhill, and I too like her writing scientific research articles, and I've just got the link there that Katie will tweet out too. Now I'll put a call out on Twitter. I suggest you read the Survive 15 uh, Survive PhD 15 feed back over the last two days, you'll see a lot of links posted there, but a couple that I've pulled out. Um, Adam Muir suggested personal wiki software. Um, he uses wiki index for refs, but notes it's a bit technical and hard to set up with uh, Microsoft Word. But I include it there because some of you I know really like to get nerdy into this, you know, build your own, put your own um, websites together and, and that's that's an interesting option you can have a look at. Jay Tozer is a fan of the Pomodoro method as many of us are and we'll tweet out a link to the Pomodoro technique but actually it's very simple you just get one of these I've actually got one Pomodoro timer and you just twist it hear a tick that's it I'm gonna put it here so it can tick and annoy everyone thanks <laughs> It's ticking down to the to the end of the broadcast. Um, okay, and uh, she's also a fan of Scrivener, as am I, huge Scrivener fan. Scrivener changed my life. Um, I could rant on and rave on about it. But I've put my key suggestion together in a slide deck, which Katie hopefully can tweet out for. Katie's working her fingers to the bone. Give her some love hearts, everyone, for this is tweeting. Why I was born. <laughs> she was born for this. Um, Sock Girl and Steph C had alerted me to the existence of share latex. It looks like an exciting development for the latex nerds, and I know you won't mind me calling you that, latex nerds amongst you. And um, Dr. McKinnon pointed me at this great post, which had eight useful starter questions for beginning an academic article. And that's all I have. That's half an hour, my God, on um, for the live forums. They get bigger and bigger each week, and it takes me hours, actually, to compile that little script, but I hope it's useful. I'll stay online, I think, for another five or ten minutes. So if you've got any questions from Twitter, please, yep. colleagues. Yep. Just let me go back and look. Yep. Um, okay. <laughs> Take a moment. Taking a moment. Okay. Mm. Um, there was a discussion on the Twitter feed about blogging as a way to get started writing. Yep. And Emily Rochette asks... Um, I want to blog, but I worry about being scooped. Oh, everyone worries about being scooped. Yep, it's a legitimate fear. Um, there's two ways to respond to that. A blog has a timestamp, so it's a way of publishing an idea and owning it and putting a stake in it. So even if you are scooped, you have some evidence that you thought of it before. However, I would still say that if it's an idea under development that you're worried about someone else taking further, don't, don't blog about it or blog about it peripherally. You might talk about, say, the method, rather than the findings, or you might talk about the findings rather than the method, or you might talk about literature. Um, often it's that blogging is a really good way to start your literature review because you're forced to make it coherent. You've got an audience in mind. Um, you're forced to tidy up all your grammar and your expression, and you can often just lift that straight out into a literature review. So, And usually, because you're only talking about other people's work, 
It's a low risk form of blogging and it's also a really good way of keeping your references together. Yes, yes. excellent. Um, I was just reading tweets about how great I am, so sorry about this. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, she's great. More love for Katie. <laughs> Tap the screen if you love Katie and I'll show her. Look. Look, Katie. Thanks, everybody. Oh, look. Thanks. We work for love. Um, <laughs> um, someone whose name I did not write down, I'm a very mm -hmm. sorry person, mm. uh, says, good feedback makes me nervous. Oh. That was it. Good I feedback makes me nervous. Should you be nervous about good feedback? Yeah, well, you know, actually at one point during my PhD, I had to tell my supervisor to be mean to me. <laughs> and then I kind of immediately wished I hadn't. Because <laughs> then he really was. But it was actually good for me. So sometimes I think um, the supervisor might think, you know, she doesn't need to hear this right now. She's a bit vulnerable. Maybe I just won't say what I really think. And, um, and maybe you do have to ask for um, more feedback. Sometimes you get that good feedback that's really just quite disengaged like this is great you say well, what did you really like about it? I don't know the whole thing was great and you sort of can tell people who haven't really engaged or read it so yeah I can it's a kind of sounds like a random comment but I can understand where you're coming from there so um, sometimes you just have to ask people to be mean and it's good for you well not mean but you know critical <laughs> I always try and think when I'm editing someone's work you know I'm 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 doing it with that that friend going shopping with you Point of view. You know, a, friend, a good friend who goes shopping will tell you if your backside looks too big in something and that's the, that's the attitude I like to take. Like I think this person would rather hear it from me where it doesn't really matter than hear it from an examiner. So sometimes supervisors have to be led into that. Um, there was a lot of love for the Pomodoro uh, timer that you have yeah. but Bianca does did yell the ticking. The ticking. You know what I'm going to take it outside and put it outside the door like a bomb. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Goodbye, Pomodoro. Goodbye, Pomodoro. We'll see you later. Uh, we're trending top five in Australia. Oh, right? we're top five, yay. We trend. Um, awesome. Yep. Another question was um, from Bianca Hennessy. She's just getting started. She would like some tips about how to start writing before you have any of your data. Mm. Uh, the Manchester Phrase Bank is a really good place to start. I think you can start looking at those sentence scaffolds and start to adapt them to your own uh, needs. There's a whole section on literature. So if you haven't got data yet, you certainly would have been reading stuff. So use that as a place to start practicing how to use those sentence scaffolds and then you can move on to sort of starting to insert your data in there. Also diagrams and tables and graphs, um, preparing those kind of things if they're the sort of things you have in your research are really useful because I think they just give you a prompt to write to. So often in boot camps, for example, we'll get people to bring in all their graphs or make graphs and that's a really good way to sort of remind them what it is they have to write. Yep. Um, and Audrey D asked a question which I only wrote down half of. Oh, let me find it. Yeah. How, how do we get the pure scientists to stop the passive voice slash supposedly objective writing? Oh, well, you know, scientists are pretty wedded to that. It's got a really long history. I suggest if you're really interested in the, in the use of passive voice and objectivity in science, you start reading Stephen Sharpen's work on gentleman sciences of the 18th century. I think we need to understand where and why these practices come from. Um, before we challenge them because they're often there for really good reason. Um, again, my fr friend Sean Lehman talks about Barry the lab assistant. So he says the passive voice is useful and that's in my slide deck on spring cleaning your writing. The passive voice is useful because you want to say the mice were injected with carcinogens. You don't want to say Barry the lab assistant injected the live mice with them. <laughs> because it really doesn't matter. Lab assistants, and terribly sorry to anyone who is a lab assistant, they're interchangeable. They're <gasps> fungible units. Presumably they do things the same way each time because that's science, right? It's procedure. Um, and so Barry might do it different from Gary. So we don't say Barry and then Gary. We, we take the individual out. So there's all these reasons about how knowledge is made and constructed that sit behind why we have some of these conventions. And surprisingly, it might surprise you to know that um, scientists use the personal pronouns you know, uh, more than the humanities. Yep, that's actually true. So they use we all the time, but they use it to describe what they've done. So we, you know, put stuff in the centrifuge or we did this or we did that. So actually it's the humanities who don't use the personal pronoun. 
um, often as often um, in the lingus corpus um, analysis that I've read at least. I'd be happy to be proved wrong on that, of course, if someone's got some other data. But, um, but that's a really useful thing to reflect on, that we, the way we write reflects how we make knowledge. Mm. Oh, just let me have one other look. Um, Periscope people, so now is the time to think about, I know you've, I've been seeing these comments coming through and of course I kind of ignore the questions um, because I can't talk and read the questions, but if you've got a question I will, uh, we is the royal I, right Audrey? Yes, that's exactly right. So we is an invitation, that's a rhetorical move, an invitation to the reader. Um, I is more individual, so they use we rather than I because it's the collective and it's the collective that makes science. And, you know, if you really are interested in this topic, James Hartley's written a number of excellent books on the on the matter. I've got them over there. Real nerdy. <laughs> um, Any more questions on Periscope? Why are the hearts different colours? I have no idea, but it I really does change it up. Oh, Katie knows. Um, if you notice the color of their username, pick the user oh. photo and the color of the heart's the same. So, so it's meant to match the, the username to the person, but there's so many of you on here that we can't tell. Hello, so, Tom Sear. Nice to see you on here tonight. Um, everyone has um, their own color. All right. They're all a special flower. We're told not to use I, lol. Yes. Well, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, yes, a lot of supervisors go through and spend great lengths of time taking I or we out of their students' thesis um, for no good purpose. Um, sometimes they take them out for good purpose. It's all about the weight. Um, uh, and I would refer you to Pat Thompson's um, Helping Doctoral Students to Write. Um, I, uh, end of the earth, I can't understand the question. Sorry, I lost the, con the context for that. Um, yeah, so um, Pat Thompson has a really great discussion in helping doctoral students to write about the use of the personal pronoun, and um, it's a lot more um, structured than you think. Now, how do you deal with bad feedback when your deadline is looming, says Tim Mouthread. Mm. Uh, no worse time to hear something from your supervisor like, I've always felt this area of the thesis was flawed. <laughs> Three weeks before presentation, of the final draft. In fact, someone was sitting in my office on Monday afternoon, pretty much saying that this is what their supervisor said to them, which, you know, <sighs> timing, not great. Uh, what can you do about that? Well, of course, it's a huge blow to your confidence. So the, the advice I gave this student was, you know, gee, thanks for that advice, but I need to be really, I need it really specific and actionable. So if you're going to criticize or say this one is flawed, then tell me why. Give me the exact lines. I've given you really quite a full draft. Um, specific and actionable, please. Um, Anna CCRV asks uh, where we can find the links. The Storify um, compilation that we send out with the live chat in the um, final thoughts section. We'll, we'll document them. You don't have to have Twitter. How do you deal with co-supervisors with different expectations? Tune into last week's Periscope, which is still up there online which will deal with that. Someone asked a question before, I'm sorry I didn't catch the name, about when it's too early to present findings. I don't, I think that's really an individual decision to make and it's something you should do in consultation with your supervisor. Um, it's really just too early to say. I'm always a fan of, of, of letting your research out early but I think you have to be very selective about the audiences. So going to a very prestigious conference and presenting very early stage PhD unformed thoughts can probably make you look like a bit too much of a newbie, but doing it in a seminar setting or a lab meeting is perfectly appropriate. So it's sort of gauging that level of audience um, participation. Hello, Jules, M88 from San Francisco. Great. Uh, thank you, Trillia. That was a very nice comment. Multimodal resources. That's what we're all about here at ANU, right, Richard? Of course. <laughs> Richard said, of course. Richard runs ANU Online, who is one of the people that brings the MOOCs to you. So that's... Um, Thank you very much, Richard. <laughs> Any other comments from Twitter, um, questions from Periscope? We're at 10 minutes past the hour. Um, Laura Thompson was inspired by our discussion to start a blog. And right. she says, do you have any good links on starting your blog? Pro blogger. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. No better place. I learned almost everything I know about blogging from pro blogger. I followed the seven pillars theory or something, and that's how you get thesis whisperer. Yep. Excellent. Any other questions? 
Uh, I think that was it, unless okay. there's any more. We're 10 past. You've stayed on so well. Thank you so much. Thank you for helping us trend. And uh, thank you for staying with Survive Your PhD. We'll be sending out an email, of course, in the morning. And I look forward to having a live chat with you next week. Thank you.